Our first scripture comes from the book of Psalms, number 104, verses 1 through 9, then verses 24 and 35. With all that I am, O Lord, I declare you to be the best. O Lord, my God, you are the greatest. You are decked out in glory and distinction, and the brilliant rays of the sun are your robe. You make the Milky Way the ceiling and the ocean bed the foundation for your house. You fly first class in the clouds, taking off and landing with the wind. You have appointed the winds to deliver your message and flames of fire to administer your will. You built the earth on firm foundation so that nothing can shake it loose. You wrapped the planet up in an ocean that submerged even the mountains. Only when you gave the word did the waters back off. With a voice of thunder, you sent them running. Cascading from the mountaintops, they poured down valleys and came to rest in the place you had marked out for them. You marked out the shore and declared the land off limits so that the oceans would not drown the earth again. O oh Lord, what a wildly fabulous world. Working hand in hand with wisdom, you have made an earth full of wonderful creatures. I give you all the credit, Lord. Mm, that was a nice one. Okay, our next one comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 30 through, blah, 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 35 through 45. This is the NRSV version. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand, one at your left hand, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking for. Are you able to drink from the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we're able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lorded over them. And their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you, you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you, you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. This is God's word for God's kingdom. Thanks be to the Lord. Hi. My name is Jesse, and I am an only child. It's funny how in certain social situations, uh, that makes me a weirdo. Amen. Sort of like when I tell people I don't drink coffee, I get all sorts of, why are you like that looks, you know? Now, if you want to get technical, I do have a half-sister. Uh, she's 11 years older than me, and she's my dad's daughter from his first marriage. Now, I didn't discover that I had a half-sister until I was 15 years old. So Judy and I never lived under the same roof. So our relationship is a whole lot more like friends than it is siblings. So, you know, I had a lot to learn about uh, how siblings relate to each other. 
because I married a woman who is the youngest of five siblings. Let me tell you about the first time that I went to Montesano, Washington in 1986 to take part in the semi-annual family reunion of the Lunsford family. Hmm. This was an interesting trip. Uh, I had already met Mary's biological siblings, her other siblings. I met Stuart and Kathy, who lived with their mom and stepdad in the Dallas, Oregon. But this was the first time when I went to Washington that I met her biological dad and her step-siblings. And of course, when we went there, uh, there was the usual awkward, oh, so you're the new boyfriend, huh, moments. Uh, that didn't bother me, though, because everything was going great. I, I like these people. They were going great until all the siblings and their significant others sat down in the dining room to play table games. You know where this is going, right? We played all sorts of games that evening. We played Uno and Trivial Pursuit and, and an amazing number of variations on poker. Uh, I, that was what got me, so many variations on poker. But the last game that we played that evening was Pictionary. Now, for those of you who have never played Pictionary before, it's a board game similar to charades. But instead of acting out the words for other people to guess, you try to draw the word on a notepad. So Mary and I, we already knew how to play this game. We'd played this uh, with our friends in college. In fact, we might even been the ones that, that brought Pictionary to the reunion. I don't know. My, my memory's not that good. So there we all were having good, clean, family fun at this semi-annual Lunsford family reunion. Now, on, on the drive up to this reunion, Mary warned me about her family and indicated that I might not get them. I said, why? Because I'm an only child, a weirdo. Well, I didn't think there was anything unusual about her family. They, they all seemed normal, whatever that is, I guess, that is, until we started playing Pictionary. The rules are that you can only use drawings and symbols. You cannot speak or write words. You can, uh, you can draw, and you can use little hand signals, including, yeah, keep going, you're on the right track, or, ooh, cut that in half, cut that phrase in half. And because we played so much in college, Mary and I were pretty good at this game. I mean, we were really good at this game. And uh, what the deal was is her, her stepbrother, David, he was kind of a competitive person. He and his wife were tied for first place with us. And when it was our turn, Mary drew a card from the deck, and the word was pharmacy. That's a tough one, isn't it? You know? So she took her pencil and paper and drew what looked like a chalice on the paper. And I thought, ooh, a uh, holy grail. No, that's not it. <laughs> Disciples of Christ. No, that's not it. And then she drew what looked like a little stick coming out of the top of this chalice. And I thought, ooh, a bowl of soup. No, that wasn't it. A bowl of cereal. No, that wasn't it. So then she drew what looked like an R on the chalice. But then she drew a line through the tail of that R, which kind of made it look like an X, but that little egg timer was running out of sand. We, we only had seconds left before we would lose that round and thus lose the game. But then I took one more guess. Pharmacy. Woohoo, right? We won. Or did we? Her stepbrother David had a few things to say about that drawing. He said, wait a minute, you can't draw letters. And Mary said, it's not a letter, it's a symbol. David said, no, that's clearly the letter R. And Mary said, sure, it looks like an R, but there's a little line right there that uh, makes it a symbol. And David said, no, that makes it an X. 
You have two separate letters here, R and X. You might as well have just written pharmacy right there on that piece of paper. And Mary said, but I didn't. Pharmacy doesn't have the letter X, does it? So I'm going to spare you the details of the fight that broke out. But I will say that was, it was an indicator that uh, game time was over at the Lunsford family reunion there. And I was dumbfounded. I thought, who in the heck spends that much time, effort, and energy uh, on something that just seems so trivial? Who the heck digs up examples from their early childhood to prove that one is either a cheater or a bully? Because those were the terms that were flying around. Who would do that? Siblings, I discovered. That's who. And I'm the weirdo, right? Amen. <sighs> See, I was glad that I was able to bear witness to this because it helped me when we started our own family and we had three boys. The, the thing is, is their rivalry is a lot more passive, but it's, it's still pretty brutal, right? But when you think about it, the Bible is filled with examples of sibling rivalry. You've got Cain and Abel. You've got Jacob and Esau. You've got Rachel and Leah. You've got Mary and Martha. <laughs> You've got Joseph and 12 of his siblings. And so the example that we have here today in Scripture is uh, an argument among the 12 disciples. And you might say, yeah, but they weren't brothers. Yeah, but it was started by brothers, right? James and John started. And, and we also have Peter and, uh, and uh, Andrew in there too. So don't think for a minute that they weren't innocent in this whole rapidly escalating argument. Who among us will sit at the right hand of Jesus. And this isn't the first time they've had this argument either. If you go back one chapter from this one, back in chapter 9, they were arguing about who among them was the greatest. Who was Jesus' favorite? Imagine the disciples were in the presence of Jesus, who they believed was the Christ, the Messiah of God Almighty. And ever since they met him, Jesus had been telling them about the mysteries of the reign of God and uh, uh, this mystery of the kingdom of God. And many of his parables, if you think about it, started out with the kingdom of God is like a, you know, whatever. He was given his disciples a glimpse of this future that God had in store for the world. But instead of relishing in his teachings and hanging on his every word, they were completely fixated on their own agendas. They were competing for Jesus' attention like little kids who were like, Dad likes me best. No, Dad likes me best. Who among them? would be Jesus' second in command in this kingdom that he spoke of. That's what they were concerned with. This was sibling rivalry on a cosmic scale. Now, what do we often call each other in church? Brothers and sisters, right? Brother Bill, Sister Gwen. We sing songs about being a family of God. When, when somebody comes forward to become a member of the church or start a journey of faith, we sing that song about being a part of the family of God. Now, Katie, our former association, uh, associate minister, Katie Valentine, she'd push back on me on that one. She would say, yeah, but what if somebody had a traumatic childhood? What if they carry wounds uh, from their family of origin? What if they were marginalized? What if they were picked on? Uh, what if family wasn't a very good thing? And I'd say, you know what? That's when the church has an opportunity to model what a healthy family is supposed to be. But as we all know, even in God's family, there are sibling rivalries. Anytime we get swept up into petty arguments 
over whose opinions counts more or who should or shouldn't be in charge, we succumbed to divisions. Even the church is capable of being the source of trauma for many people. So yeah, Katie was right. But I still stand by my assertion that we can be better and we can provide a good example of what a healthy family looks like, a family where everyone is included, a family where all means all. Whenever rivalries in church happen, we miss out on the chance to see Jesus in his glory. We miss out on an opportunity for God to share something bold and exciting, a vision for the future of hope for tomorrow. Every time we get caught up in ourselves, we miss the chance to hear God's voice. Jesus' words to his disciples, and I'm talking disciples then and today, is whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be servant of all. Now, if you want to be truly great in God's kingdom, it's not about how many people are below you. It's about how many people are above you. If you truly want the attention of our heavenly parent, it's not about how many people serve you, but how many people you serve. If you want to be first, you got to be last. It's not about the glory you get. It's about the glory God gets through you. Okay, well, but that's not the way it works in the real world. And that's the point. That's why we're having this series in the first place, right? We know that's not the way it works in the real world. But this series is about the upside-down kingdom of God. That's what we're studying. We've been talking about the many ways that the kingdom of God is different than the world's kingdoms. In fact, it's completely opposite from the empires of the world. To get ahead in the world's kingdoms, you got to, what's the old karate kid saying, strike first and show no mercy. Uh, in the kingdoms of the world, now we, another movie res, uh, reference, Wall Street, greed is good, right? Greed is good in the world. You've got to be a cheater and a bully, not just to win Pictionary, but to win the game of, of life. And I'm not talking the Milton Bradley game either. There's no room for deference. Compromise is seen as weakness. The rulers of earth's kingdoms work hard to take your freedom away while convincing you that they, as the benevolent ruler, are the ones who can lead you to freedom. The fruits of Caesar's rule. The markers of Caesar's legacy. The results of his actions are anger, jealousy, strife, division, impurity, idolatry. Sounds like sibling rivalry at its worst. But remember, the kingdom of God is the upside down of this. It's just the upside. It's the other side of the coin. The fruits of God's rule are love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. As the Apostle Paul says in the book of Galatians, of these things, there is no law. Sibling rivalries occur when spiritual siblings, sisters and brothers, fail to recognize that there is plenty of God's love and attention to go around. Because when, you, when you're siblings and when you're in, in uh, contention with each other, there's never enough. There's not enough attention. There's not enough Oreo cookies for everybody. There's not enough anything. It's an attitude of scarcity. 
But when we are under God's rule, there is plenty of love and attention to go around. When we fail to see this, we scramble around desperately trying to replace that sense of God's love with things that are just temporary. Once again, it is about having an attitude of abundance rather than an attitude of scarcity. We end up trying to convince each other that there is somehow this hierarchy of God's love in the church and that there's not enough to go around. But there is enough love to go around. There is enough resources to go around. There is enough time to live a full and fruitful life. But most of the time, we're, we're just victims of our own folly. When we grasp and hoard and compete and fight, everyone loses. When we serve each other, we help usher God's kingdom to earth. May our prayer today be, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, O Lord, on earth as it is in heaven.